here has heard about the mental health crisis? Yes, everyone. We all either are or know someone who is struggling with significant psychological distress, which negatively impacts our lives. But the actual problem is that we've generated no real solutions to addressing it. This is not to say that no problems, no solutions are being proposed. In December, Mayor Eric Adams, concerned about crime in New York City, announced that members of the New York police and fire departments would be permitted to take unhoused individuals to psychiatric inpatient hospitals against their will. Pharmaceutical companies or financial judgments against pharmaceutical companies have been pledged to address the opioid epidemic. But solutions like these, although I honestly believe that they are well-intended and they come from a place of genuine desire to help other people, are pretty poorly informed and lacking in substance. The reason is that we've failed to understand why so many of us are struggling with mental illness. That's where I come in. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist who has treated clients in diverse settings nationwide, and the things that I've learned behind my closed therapy office door are things that we all need to better understand if we're going to see the systemic failure to promote the psychological well-being of our fellow humans. Today, I'm going to pull back the curtain so that you can see these systemic causes and become agents of change. These are extremely complicated problems to solve, and there is no one therapeutic strategy that works for everyone. I'm here today to shine a light on an often unacknowledged aspect that contributes to our psychological distress. We don't have all of the answers, and there is significant resistance to acknowledging all of these different factors that contribute to this problem. What you can do, though, is you can internalize what I'm telling you today. You can reflect on the ways in which these ideas impact your day-to-day -day feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. And you can talk about these things with everyone you know so that we can change the conversations that we are having about mental health. The most common explanation well-meaning people give about why so many people struggle with mental illness is that it's a combination of genes or biological factors and stressors. Now, it's not inaccurate in to say that genes and stressors result in psychological distress, but it is an incomplete explanation, meaning that we will fail to really generate good, adequate solutions to address the mental health crisis. So what's missing in our conceptualization? Well, here's the answer. It's, it's not simple, but it's short, at least for this context. The simple or the short answer is that we have built our society around three core beliefs that, when taken to their extreme, are a recipe for psychological distress. These factors are the myth of the self-made man, the celebration of independence, and the demonization of emotions. So why are these so problematic? The myth of the self-made man became prominent in the 1800s in the stories by Horatio Alger, in which a young man, it was always a man, was born into less than ideal circumstances and pulled himself up by his bootstraps into, to achieve socioeconomic success. This sounds like the American dream, right? Work hard and you'll succeed. The problem is that it is the exception and not the rule that hard work leads to socioeconomic mobility, which is our current societal definition of worth. So, if it were that simple, would it make the news whenever someone was discovered who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps out of impoverished circumstances to achieve socioeconomic success? Do we make movies about students studying hard for an exam and getting a good grade? Why not? Simply because it doesn't defy the odds for it to happen. Even before we are born, some of us have circumstances that were created by other people that facilitate success, that facilitate a successful path in life. Now, to be clear, I am not saying that having a secure start in life guarantees success. 
But what I am saying is that it is that much harder to learn or to even be exposed to opportunities to develop your skills, talents, and interests if your basic needs aren't met. It's possible, but it's not probable. And we are telling people that it is an individual failure that they are not successful, and that is not a way to promote psychological wellness. We are telling people that they are lazy or they aren't trying hard enough, when really, from day one, they haven't had the opportunity to achieve what they might have otherwise had the opportunity to achieve had their basic needs been met. I've seen this endlessly discounted over the course of my career. People who, if you knew their life story, you would recognize had tried over and over again to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and become self-made humans, only to find that they encountered endless, insurmountable obstacles. They don't come to me because they're outraged by the systemic inequities that created this. They come to me because they have internalized the belief that it is their fault that they have not been able to achieve whatever it is that they've been trying to achieve. I can't sit behind my locked therapy office door and act as if this is some shameful topic unable to be brought into the light of day when behind my closed doors, people are actually honest about their struggles. The myth of the self-made man is a fantasy. And until we acknowledge that, we are not going to be able to find any viable solutions to address the mental health crisis. Even the process by which we treat mental illness is an example of this problem in action. In order to get treatment, you need to have both resources and providers. Assuming you can get these things, you are then instructed to take medication and or go to see a therapist and figure out ways to cope with whatever's going on in your life. The problem is that this leads to this idea that psychological wellness is under your individual control, meaning that if you work hard enough, you'll be able to fix it. But this isn't possible because our society is constructed in a way that makes that impossible to do. This is a nice segue into the celebration of independence, which is related to this idea of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. How often do you hear about how important it is to be independent and to not rely on others for your happiness? This type of messaging creates so much shame and despair for the vast majority of us who desperately want to have emotional closeness and connection with people. This comes up all the time in couples therapy, which is one of my areas of expertise. One or both partners comes to my office and they tell me that they don't want the other person to be dependent or codependent on them. This is when I introduce the idea of interdependence, which is a reliance on another person in ways that both people find to be empowering and supportive, but which doesn't require either person to lose their authenticity or behave in ways that violate their deeply held values uh, in order to maintain the relationship. Forming, the, forming these types of connections and valuing these types of connections is a path to psychological wellness. How do I know this? Because having a strong social support system is a protective factor for suicide, and it protects against the exacerbation of severe mental illness. Having robust social networks contributes to our longevity and to our happiness. Couples therapy is an evidence-based intervention that is indicated for some women who are struggling with depression. So we can't revere independence and also claim that we want to find solutions to the mental health crisis when some of those solutions point directly to the importance of closeness and connection. We can't have it both ways. This brings the last factor out of the shadows, the demonization of emotions. I cannot tell you how often people tell me how logical they are, like it's some kind of virtue. This is not to say there's not a time and a place for logic, but failing to understand how imperative both emotions and logic are to our survival is another recipe for psychological distress. It also leads many people to feel shame when they even experience emotions because they feel like they shouldn't. They feel like they shouldn't have any emotional reaction at all. 
So here's how this fits into today's general theme. We've constructed a society in which we've conferred huge advantages to some and left others without even their basic needs met. We encourage people to be independent islands who rely on no one. And we expect people to go through life without feeling emotion, even though I think we can all agree that this life is really very stressful. And when people do dare to experience emotion, they are instructed to regulate them. So people have what is a very reasonable emotional reaction to something that happens, and they experience shame and loneliness because they feel like they're burdening the people around them if they dare to share it, and they think they shouldn't be having an emotional reaction anyway. These are some of the more subtle ways in which these ideas show up in our lives. I want you to think about how deeply you have internalized these as truths rather than as simply societal constructs that we've created to establish our socioeconomic hierarchy. Recognize that these factors are uh, factors in how we've constructed our healthcare system, our education system. They impact how we approach our romantic relationships, parenting, friendships, and the expectations or lack thereof that we have for community. They are everywhere and they are harming us. You may have been surprised, well, I don't think you were surprised when I mentioned that these factors contributed to the construction of our healthcare and education systems. But what may have surprised you was when I mentioned romantic relationships, because you may not realize just how deeply you have internalized these values and how they show up in your life. A romantic relationship or a primary partnership is one of the only acceptable ways in our society to not be independent. In fact, we are permitted to rely on a romantic partner, sort of, and in very specific ways, like um, making sure that the household runs smoothly. But how often have you found yourself asking yourself something like, if I snap my person, will they think I'm too needy? Am I being the dreaded codependent? Am I expecting too much time with my partner or expecting too much communication about emotion? Think about what happens when you first meet a potential partner and the types of topics that you talk about. When we first meet someone, we think that we're supposed to hang out with them and engage in enjoyable activities, but we are not supposed to talk about controversial topics like finances, religion, or politics. Why? Because these topics elicit emotion. And we are socialized to believe that it is unacceptable to talk about things that people may feel uncomfortable emotions about. I directly challenge this by saying that in order to have emotional closeness and connection, we need to have conversations about challenging topics. So you can see from this example just how subtly and pervasively these ideas have kind of like extended their little fingers into our lives. Let's wrap up by talking about what needs to happen to address the mental health crisis. We need to challenge any surface level uh, solutions. And we need to insist that our elected officials listen to experts so that they can truly change these dysfunctional constructed systems. Unfortunately, as I've discovered in my own political activism, People in power are socialized with these same values, and so they have likely internalized this belief that the individuals should help themselves, so they question, why do we need policy change? They've also benefited from these systems, and they are loath to disrupt systems that are working for them. This is the ultimate irony. Appropriately constructed systems are possible to achieve if policymakers facilitate individuals being able to help themselves. So again, we can see that change is necessary and change is possible if we recognize all of these insidious ways in which these factors and ideas and values have permeated our lives. One thing we know from acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT, is that we often lose sight of our deeply held values and we engage in strategies of emotional avoidance even when experiencing emotional distress would be in the service of these values. But when you're clear about your values and you stop prioritizing not feeling badly, 
It turns out that the behaviors and actions that are consistent with your overarching values become pretty clear. The same is true for reconstructing our harmful systems. We know that our systems are built on the systemic inequities that are a natural consequence of the myth of the self-made man, the celebration of independence, and the demonization of emotions. Recognizing that means that we can actually reconstruct systems that work to benefit all of us, not just a few. This may seem overwhelming, but we can and should do this, because without such efforts, we will continue to spin our wheels and wonder why we have not adequately addressed the mental health crisis. People suffer when we do not acknowledge these flaws and pledge to address them. As is consistent with the theme of today's talk, this is not something that we can do on an individual basis. We must change the conversations that we are having as a society so before we can even hope to generate adequate solutions to address this problem. That's where you all come in. You can help me to challenge this incomplete understanding of mental illness by talking about these ideas with everyone you know. This is it. We must acknowledge what we have built in order to move forward and make the necessary changes to protect each other. Thank you.